Um, thank you for coming uh, to this event of the lecture series of the School of Architecture and Planning. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest tonight, um, Frederick Steiner, who we really know as Fritz Steiner, and we're going to refer to him as Fritz from now on, um, is the Dean and Paley Professor at the University of Pennsylvania School of Design. Previously, he served 15 years as the Dean of the School of Architecture and Henry, Henry M. Rockwell Chair in Architecture at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, Fred earned a PhD in City and Regional Planning from University of Pennsylvania, an MA in City and Regional Planning from University of Pennsylvania, and a Master of Regional Planning from the University of Pennsylvania, um, a Master of Community Planning from University of Cincinnati, and a Bachelor of Science and Design from the University of Cincinnati as well. And he's also received an honorary MPhil in Human Ecology from the College of the Atlantic. Uh, Fritz was a Fulbright Hayes Scholar at Wageningen University, that's in the Netherlands, um, a Rome Prize Fellow in Historic Preservation at the American Academy in Rome, where he was 2013-2014 William A. Bernoudi Architect in Residence. He's a Fellow of both the American Society of Landscape Architects and the Council of Educator and Landscape Architects. He is Presidential Appointee to the National Board of the American Institute of Architects and is on the Urban Committee of the National Park System Advisory Board. And I could go on um, with these appointments, but you know it'll be like seven o'clock and you'll still be listening to me. So I'm going to just move forward. Um, Fritz is the author of many um, books and publications, author and editor of many books and publications. I will not go through all of them, but I do want to point out the latest book, I have it right here, Nature and Cities, the Ecological Imperative in Urban Design and Planning. Um, it is a wonderful, wonderful book. Don't be scared by the size and the weight, although you, you look, think of the money you'll save in the gym, right? Um, but it is a well-priced book and really, really worth having. I just encourage all of you to look into that. With that, Please join me in welcoming Fritz Steiner. Thank you, Dr. Elf Simon. And it's, uh, it's lovely to be back in Albuquerque. Um, as Elf mentioned, I was 15 years at Austin, Texas. Before that, I was 12 years at uh, Arizona State University, so um, I've been on both sides of New Mexico, well, east and west, not north and south. Um, so it's a, a real joy to be back. And just to follow on the nice plug of the Nature and Cities book, um, Lincoln did price it well. It's a big book, and it's only 50 bucks, and they just reprinted it, and it's going to be the last press uh, printing of it, and then they're going uh, it's going to be on the web even uh, less price. So anyway, so anyway, it's great to be here, and I'm going to talk about actually a. This is a, a big book, and I've got another one that's smaller, uh, that just has come out recently, and it's about making plans. And so it's going to be what I want to talk about tonight. And first, there's some definitions that uh, just. So you know where I'm coming from when I, uh, about this. this. This one, the first time I saw this definition was um, in the Galapagos Islands. And it was um, at the Charles Darwin Center. And they were selling t-shirts. Uh, and it was attributed to Charles Darwin. And I thought any, I mean, obviously the Charles Darwin Center would quote Darwin uh, correctly, but apparently, Darwin never said this or wrote this. Um, if anybody could figure out, uh, find out who did and email me that, I would appreciate it. You can go down a, a, a rabbit hole on Google trying to find out. But um, whoever, whoever wrote it or said it first, it sounds like Darwin. Um, and it, it's a, um, a, a, an idea, I think, 
about adaptation um, that is interesting. Um, design, what is design? Um, as someone uh, with a bunch of degrees in planning but is, that started in design, uh, I'm always working with my uh, planning colleagues, are, are, are we designers, are they designers or not? Uh, Herbert Simon, who uh, was a social scientist, um, this is how he designed, or how he defined design. And I, uh, I think it, it's uh, pretty encompassing and it's certainly a, a definition that, that I agree with. Um, the Ecological Society uh, of America, uh, the ecologists have gotten more and more into thinking about cities, uh, thinking about the role of ecology in cities, and they've promoted this idea of Earth stewardship. And this is how they define uh, Earth stewardship. And just, I think, one more definition, the Anthropocene, uh, the current geologic age that we live in, where we're in charge now. Uh, humans are in charge. We're um, uh, really responsible for the fundamental biological and physical processes uh, on the planet. So um, I view myself as a reflective practitioner. This is Donald Schoen, who was at MIT's definition or explanation of reflective practice. Uh, when I became an academic, I never really wanted to leave practice. I wanted to continue to be involved in real projects. And as an academic, it's my responsibility to say, well, what does that mean? What did, what did that project mean? And so tonight I want to talk about two projects. Oh, this is the so-called planning process. And this is um, uh, you define a problem, you establish goals, you do inventories, you do detailed studies. In a democracy, um, uh, citizens are involved throughout the process. Develop concepts, you do a plan, uh, de designs, and then you implement it, and you start over again. So this is um, a process that I've used a lot. Um, so uh, the two plans I was involved in, I thought, um, how were these steps actually, what do they mean um, in, in the, these two plans. Um, you don't need um, any help, I, I, I think, uh, knowing where Texas is, it's next door to you. Uh, but the red area is Travis County, Texas, which is where Austin is located. And then if you go inside of Austin, uh, this is the uh, downtown area and where the University of Texas is located. So the, 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 the city is laid out, as you can see, on a grid. Um, and it's between two streams, uh, Creeks, Shoal Creek and Waller Creek, which isn't on this map, but Interstate 35 is. And Interstate 35 is important because it divides the city uh, spatially and for many years racially. Um, and then when you get to Martin Luther King Boulevard, uh, this grid is not a true north-south, it's based on the ridge line, which the, um, uh, it goes to where the state capital. So when you get to the campus, there's this true north-south grid. And of course, one of the wonderful things about uh, being at the University of Texas uh, at Austin, we got to look down on the state capital every day. Uh, they were uh, to the south. Um, so you start with setting goals. Um, and um, so the two plans that uh, I'm going to talk about, one is Imagine Austin. In Austin, um, the city plans just can't be called city comprehensive plans. You have to give them a name. Uh, so it actually took us about, um, about six weeks of public participation to come up with the name for Imagine Austin. Um, it was the first city comprehensive plan that had been approved since uh, uh, 1979. So there had been a lot of planning in Austin, but no city plan. And it was approved um, by the city council on 
uh, uh, that date unanimously. Uh, and that's important that city council in uh, Austin uh, doesn't approve too many things unanimously. Um, of course, the architect of City Hall in Austin is the same architect who designed this building, Antoine Predock. And Predock was asked what he thought about uh, uh, Austin and Austin politics, and he called them terminally democratic. And he didn't mean that as a compliment. So that we were able to get this plan passed in Austin uh, unanimously by city council was quite an achievement. So this is um, some of the uh, uh, goals uh, that were established for Imagine Austin. Uh, and I'll go through what, how we, uh, some of the, uh, the activities involved. Um, this is a family uh, in East Austin with somebody who has a strong affiliation with landscape architecture. You love when you do community involvement and you go into the neighborhood and you say, what do you want? And they say parks. Um, so this is um, a Latino family, Hispanic family uh, from East Austin. I mentioned the city was uh, legally segregated to the 1950s. So if you look back at the zoning maps from the 1920s uh, through the 1950s when it was de declared unconstitutional, um, there was a neighborhood in East Austin called Mexican, and there was another uh, neighborhood in East Austin called Negro. And um, uh, lots changed, uh, but that divide continues. And one of the challenges in East Austin, what these people are saying, is there's not enough parks in East Austin. So uh, part of our job was to find places for parks. So these are, these are the, the uh, they, they were called objectives, but I would call them um, uh, goals. Um, lots of involvement. Um, I, I was on the uh, Citizens Task Force, so I went to all these meetings meetings. Um, this is the number of participants. Uh, we've worked very hard to uh, put all the material out, not only in English, but also Spanish, uh, also uh, Japanese and um, Chinese. And um, I would say that um, the participation was very good among African Americans, uh, Asian Americans, the uh, involvement was good. Uh, we fell short with the Hispanic uh, participation in spite of a, a lot of efforts. Um, so we worked very hard to, um, at all kinds of, of types of meetings, uh, we did uh, to, and these are just the kinds of meetings, a lot of uh, meetings uh, sitting around large maps and uh, working uh, with people where uh, different land uses would go, where roads would go, uh, where parks would go, and so on. While we were doing that, at the same time, uh, we were involved in uh, a new campus plan. The city plan involved thousands and thousands of people. The campus plan involved very few people. Uh, I was the chair of the Campus Planning Committee and also the Design Review Committee. Uh, my colleague Larry Speck, who preceded me as dean, uh, the head of the campus architect. Uh, so there was about 20 of us uh, involved in uh, the campus master plan. Of course, we involved students at ser several points. We involved faculty, but it was a much smaller group um, but we were working on it pretty much the same time frame. These were uh, what we called um, the eight big ideas, the big goals that we established for the campus. Um, and um, you can see what we, we were going to uh, have a separate uh, element for sustainability, but inside, instead we decided to weave sustainability through the whole campus plan. And um, so this was um, the diagram that we used to organize the campus plan. 
Okay, so we establish goals, um, then you go about uh, reading the landscape. Uh, what is the place? Uh, what is uh, what does it say to you? Um, love Robert Smithson, um, and um, in this in um, the case of the city, this plan had been done in 1976 by Wallace, McCard, Roberts, and Todd. It was the big influence on that 1980 plan. So McCarg's team, uh, oh, and this is Ian McCarg. Um, he smoked, which in the end killed him. Uh, he was born in Glasgow, Scotland, uh, died in Philadelphia. Um, he, of course, wrote this book, Design with Nature. As a design student at the University of Cincinnati at the first Earth Day, I, my job was to uh, organize a uh, book fair. Uh, this is what students did at that time. And so uh, I was able, there was only about eight or nine books on the environment at that time. There was uh, Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, uh, Aldo Leopold's um, Sand County Almanac, uh, Barry Commoner had a book, uh, Ralph Nader, uh, and Ian McCart was the only one that had design in the title, so uh, I thought, hmm, this looks interesting. And like many others, I read it and decided to, to go to graduate school at Penn. Well, at the same time, McCart was very involved with the planning of um, uh, all across the, the country and around the world, including working for Austin. Now, again, the city's divided. Uh, by uh, East Austin, West Austin. So why is the focus on this area? Well, under, underlying this area is the Edwards Aquifer, which is one of the richest uh, groundwater uh, reserves um, anywhere. So, uh, and also there's a system of lakes and dams um, that uh, together they supply the water for Austin. So both the east and the west, north and the south, benefit from water. It, uh, and, and, and because that area was growing uh, in the 70s, and Austin has doubled in population every 20 years since 1890. <laughs> when I heard that first, I said, that's crazy. That can't happen. Uh, but it, it is happening. And pretty soon, it'll probably surpass San Antonio as the 10th largest city in the country. So a little bit under a million, it's supposed to go up to a million and a half, two million. Metropolitan area is around two and a half million, and it's going to go up to about five million. Uh, so uh, McCarg got involved, did what McCarg did, uh, made a lot of maps. Um, and this is sort of pre-GIS. So these are hand-drawn maps, uh, and basically laid out where where good areas for development and where areas should be conserved. That led to, as I mentioned, uh, Austin always has to have names for its plans. This is the Austin Tomorrow Plan. Uh, so the Austin Tomorrow Plan passed in 1979, published in 1980, then would guide uh, the planning in Austin from 1980 until the new plan in 2012. And in that plan, um, uh, and, and the, the head planner for the plan was one of McCarg's former students, these maps became, they were based on what McCarg called suitability analysis. This little red thing here would have a big part of my life, and I'll mention why in a moment. Um, and many of the areas that are very highly valued in Austin uh, were a result of this plan. This is the Barton Creek Greenway, uh, and it's connected to the Barton Creek Pool. I have to be real careful because people in Austin tend not to wear clothing, and I wanted to make sure there was a suitable image with people in clothing, uh, and I think they all do have it on this day. Uh, but um, meanwhile, there's a, a, an endangered salamander that's naked, uh, so there's two en endangered uh, salamander habitats that swim with people every day. Uh, so uh, the salamanders are important. The people, it's a great place to swim. 
It's really a great place to swim. Uh, this is what it looks like. Because of McCarg's work uh, and others, uh, there's this greenway that's established that goes around the, uh, the uh, uh, what was called Town Lake, is now called Lady Bird Lake. Uh, this area is protected. We extend the, this another 32 miles. But that's another story. But this is what it looks like. <coughs> and there's, of course, the bats. Um, it's um, a home to a big colony of Mexican bat, uh, free-tailed bats. The, Mexi the bats come uh, and spend the winters um, in Austin uh, and then go back to Mexico, they breed there. The, I can't remember if the females come first and make, maybe it's the guys come first and they make the nest and then the females come and then there's little bats and uh, you can, uh, and they all go out and eat mosquitoes every night. So that's a, a good thing. Um, and this is um, where I lived for 15 years. Um, and that red splotch that I showed I moved into an area that had been planned by McCard and set aside by the city for growth. Um, I put in this big piece of limestone, this big fountain. I, one of the cardinal rules of, 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 the, of, of landscape architecture, I think, is don't design fountains because you have to live with them when the water doesn't work. Architects always like to put fountains in right away. And uh, most of the time, the fountains don't work. So I, I kind of solved that by getting a big piece of rock it's limestone, and then it doesn't really matter if uh, it, sometimes the water goes up and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, limestone wall, and then we put in these blue bonnets. We had all these native plants. My, my neighbor, who was a native Texan, said, you know, hon, those are going to bring snakes. They're gonna, you're going to get a bunch of snakes with those native plants. And I said, well, I don't know, ma'am, but uh, I don't mind snakes. Uh, I, there weren't any, there was a little gardener snakes and stuff came, but um, uh, kids would, they loved it, uh, and they would get their uh, pictures taken on the way to school every morning. They were polite Texan kids, so they would ask first, may I have my picture taken? So, sure. So, anyway, um, that plan had a lot of influence, so what did we inventory? What would, what, uh, so many of the, now we have GIS. We have, don't have to draw a map by hand. I, w I would be a little critical. I don't think we did as good a job as McCarg in uh, really being ambitious. Uh, we were competent, uh, mainly because of a couple of people on the Citizens Task Force. One was a, a young geographer who was just terrific. Um, but um, we looked at things like uh, watersheds, watershed regulations, which are very involved, as you can see in Austin, uh, also produced this map, which shows tree cover, tree canopy. And one of the things that's very striking about this, again, I-35, lots of tree cover here, not so much tree cover here, so that, remember that family, we want parks? Um, this is part of the reason why. Now, naturally, the Balcones um, escarpment goes along here, and these are, this is the hill country, and this is the coastal plain in the Blackland Prairie. So there is a natural uh, change uh, there as well. Um, but uh, this was a helpful map for us. Uh, looked at the wildlife uh, in addition to the salamanders and the bats. These two species were very important. Uh, and Austin ha uh, really pioneered the habitat conservation planning. The idea that if you want to protect a species, you really need to protect its habitat. So we, we did the inventory, we worked on the inventory of the overall city. Meanwhile, um, back at the, the campus plan, um, the, the most two architects had a very big influence on the University of Texas uh, plan. The first, uh, was Cass Gilbert, did a wonderful plan. He did two marvelous buildings, uh, but never, uh, it didn't have as much influence as Paul Cray. Paul Cray, uh, incredible, I think, I'll just go out and say, it, I think he's the most underestimated architect of the 20th century, at least the early 20th century. He was a Beaux-Arts architect. 
that means he was from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, originally at Lyon, and then uh, in Paris. He was recruited to Penn in 1905, uh, taught uh, there till he died in 1945. His uh, former students included people like Lou Kahn and others. Uh, and he was, and he died in West Philadelphia, about four blocks from where I live now, uh, on Woodland Place um, in West Philadelphia. And he was the campus architect for the University of Texas from 1930 to 1945. He also was a chain smoker, and he thought, he, they, I, this is not too much of a subliminal message, don't smoke, but uh, he died uh, on, on a job site in 1945. And Paul Cray um, not only did the campus plan in 1933, but he designed 19 buildings on campus. So much of the University of Texas uh, campus as a result of Paul Cray. Uh, this was his uh, wonderful 1933 plan. And like I lived in the neighborhood uh, envisioned by Ian McCart, I worked in Goldsmith Hall, which was designed by Paul Cray. So that I would return to Philadelphia someday, I think was inevitable uh, since um, I was living in places designed and planned for, by them, by Philadelphians for 15 years. So. Um, this is what uh, Paul Cray's plan. Uh, I'm very, this is the tower. This is um, uh, Goldsmith Hall. Oh, where's Goldsmith? Where am I? Here. Uh, no, well, it doesn't matter. Here. Uh, somewhere over here. And this is Waller Creek over here. This is the football stadium. Interstate 35 isn't true yet, um, but he de designed 19 buildings on campus in addition to doing a campus plan. This is what it looks like today. And so um, there wasn't a good plan done between uh, Cray's plan in the 30s and the late 90s. In the late 90s, this plan was produced and it was produced by uh, Cesar Pelli and Fred Clark. Uh, it was uh, Cesar Pelli Associates, and um, it's now called Pelli Clark Pelli. Fred was the main uh, person involved in the plan. He was a, um, um, a University of Texas graduate, and so he knew the campus very well. Um, sort of a, a lesson in campus planning, if you want uh, the president and provost to buy off on your plan, what do you do? You put the new buildings in whatever the school color is. So uh, we use burnt orange. What's, what's New Mexico's color? Cherry and silver. Huh? Cherry and silver. Cherry and silver? Yeah. Yeah, silver wouldn't work too good. But cherry, you could use cherry. So anyway, that, that we use shamelessly burnt orange, the university's colors, to uh, show which buildings would be the new buildings. Or we didn't, uh, that was Fred Clark. And they used, they did a very detailed analysis of the uh, vocabulary of the campus. And this is um, what they um, looked at and how to bring that up to date. And the plan was, uh, criticized, I think, wrongly for being too conservative and too much looking back. That's how it was interpreted by some folks, but it, it actually was a very detailed, wonderful plan. Uh, this is another one of Fred Clark's drawings. So when we updated the plan, um, we worked with Sasaki Associates, uh, and I would say Sasaki Associates just did a fabulous job. It's a firm founded by um, Hideo Sasaki, longtime chair of the landscape architecture uh, department at Harvard. Uh, our guy was Dan Keeney, who worked on the plan. Uh, and Dan uh, did a marvelous job with us and his team. I mentioned we developed this thing to show uh, our, uh, and then we went back and we looked, what about, how has the University of Texas grown through the years? Um, 
And this just shows from when it started, uh, the original 40 acres, Paul Cray's plan, uh, the, the not so loved modernist uh, era, the postmodern era or the Pelly plan. The university worked very hard to cap uh, the number of students at 51 to 52,000. Um, and so that's held study. But then even though we've been hold, we, I still say that, but uh, even though the University of Texas was holding students steady, then the amount of square feet uh, that we needed kept going up. Why is that? Why, if you're holding um, the students study, why would the need for more square feet go up? This is school. Pardon me? What? What, Roger? The business school. The business school uh, actually. Lots of space. Actually, a bit. It's a joke. Well, actually, uh, it's true. Uh, the business school was part of it. Uh, the big driver, the, the two big drivers in our case, uh, was one, uh, research facilities. Um, the need for research space keeps getting bigger. Uh, the footprints keep getting bigger. Uh, and it's very difficult to go back and retrofit old uh, labs. Uh, the second is um, uh, there, was a, there isn't much student housing for a university as big as the University of Texas, so we wanted more student housing on campus. And fourth, because of weird quirks in Texas history, and not all there is in Texas history is weird quirks, uh, there was no medical school in Austin. It was the largest city without a medical school. Uh, Phoenix claimed that for a while too, and they fixed that. Um, but there was no medical school, so we started a medical school. So, in the so these square feet, feet have have proven uh, pretty accurate. So we um, borrowed from the Pelly plan and used burn orange. Um, we there's the East Campus. This is Interstate 35. Very bad history between the university and the neighboring communities over here, mostly who are African American. Uh, the central campus uh, and the core. Why didn't we call it the west campus? Well, the, this is, that's the name of the neighborhood over here, and so we called it the core. Plus, that's where the, the main uh, um, Paul Cray buildings are. We did a lot of uh, analysis uh, looking at density, looking at uh, building coverage. Uh, and we mainly found that the part of the campus that was the most loved was also the densest. It's about as dense as Columbia, New York. Uh, so density by itself, uh, it, it can be a, a, a very helpful for campus planning. Um, we also looked at tree coverage and interestingly, uh, this part of the campus, uh, this is Waller Creek. The, the canopy was much, uh, much richer than the, uh, the central uh, and the east part of the campus. This is what it looks like, the tree canopy. And not surprisingly, the coolest part of the campus is the part with the most trees. So the areas are dense. They have lots of uh, arcades, walkways, small courtyards, uh, lots of trees. Um, this area has lots of, of uh, parking lots and uh, large uh, spaces between the buildings. Uh, also, Walla Creek um, was something that had been ignored pretty much by the university. And part of the overall strategy was, and it was tied into a city effort at the same time to uh, improve Waller Creek. Okay, um, I, this is my favorite quote to show architects because I'm, I'm not always the most popular guy because I write regulations that um, the architects don't like very much sometimes. If you say you've got to have 15% impervious service over the uh, uh, aquifer, it's that, oh, I don't need, I can, I, I can design this. And um, uh, design 
depends largely on constraints. Embrace constraints. I think that's that's the key to really good design is understanding what the constraints are and working around them. So uh, again, uh, looking at uh, how McCarg did it, he looked at opportunities and constraints for development. Uh, we updated his approach, uh, working with the Trust for Public Land. Um, we helped them develop this tool called Green Printing. It's a GIS overlay system. And so we basically worked uh, doing the same kind of McCargian analysis, but identifying areas uh, that were most important for conservation. And we were very keen, this is Travis County, to look at um, the areas over on the east side and find what are the opportunities. And one of them was the flood, the flood, uh, the river corridors and so on that could be developed and protected and also uh, used for parkland. And we looked bigger at a four county area and again how those networks would con connect. And while we were looking at areas for protection, we were also looking at where, uh, where are the best areas to develop. We used a concept called the centers concept. So we're looking at ta uh, uh, regional centers like downtown, uh, also town centers, uh, looking really important at neighborhood centers to redevelop them, make them better, uh, looking at how do you uh, develop centers over environmentally sensitive areas, one of the most controversial parts of the plan. Uh, and also job centers, uh, because the people on the east side of the town also wanted, they wanted more parks, and they wanted more access to jobs. So we used the, the centers concept. Back on campus, the strategy was how do we, how do we densify this part of the campus uh, so it's more similar to this. We also then developed a uh, separate plan for this area at the neighbor's request. Let me back up just a second. When we started this planning effort, it was right in the midst of the recession. Uh, Sasaki, the price that for everything we wanted was a little bit over $2 million, and the university didn't quite have $2 million. We had $1,400,000. So, um, Sasaki kind of cut us a deal, but then we said well, there would be other phases of the plan and um, we would hire them to do that. So uh, we phased it out uh, for, I, I know I'm, I'm the poor land, the landscape element went and, the, and then it came back. Um, so, um, and the medical district plan went and came, well, anyway, we, we Sasaki did very well in the end. They got, if you go to the University of Texas campus planning and you look at the number of plans on the, on the website, Sasaki did a, did a lot of work. Because the recession ended, the plans were successful. We were able to build uh, on success. And so then you look at design. What are the, how, do you, how do you start to take these concepts uh, and start to make them designs? How do you link design and planning? We, uh, had a lot of good precedents in Austin, places people loved. Uh, the, uh, my colleague Sinclair Black had done the Great Streets project, and, um, and some of it had been implemented, so we could show uh, places like Second Street uh, where uh, people were, uh, loved it. Um, also, we were involved in um, Part of the School of Architecture at the University of Texas is the Lady Bird Johnson Welfare Center. So we got involved uh, at Laura Bush's request to, um, um, to design uh, with Michael Van Valkenburg the, um, it, it, I assume people know SMU. SMU's a really, I mean, you know, it's a really button up place and every blade of grass is cultivated and curated. And so the idea of a really, um, uh, this uh, native plant garden was, was kind of out there. So we, we want to say, look, if the bushes can do it in Dallas, uh, you know, we, there's some room here in Austin. Now I'm going to go on a little bit of a side journey, and I'll come back. 
But while I was doing those, working on those two plans, um, I was involved with the American Society of Landscape Architects, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildfire Center, and the U.S. Botanic Garden, and GBCI, and the U.S. Green Building Council to develop lead for the outdoors. And it was called the Sustainable Sites Initiative. So, um, and it was how do you, well, this, um, we, um, believed that there were there was a equivalent that could be developed uh, for uh, landscape design that would be equivalent to building design. Um, we we used the concept of ecosystem services, basically what nature gives us for free uh, that we don't have to pay for. Uh, and if you know ecosystem services, there are four kinds of ecosystem services. Uh, so-called supporting services, provising, uh, provisioning services, regulating services, and contributing, uh, also called cultural services. And so we looked at the kinds of ecosystem <coughs> services that would be applicable at a site level, and we argued that uh, ecosystem services were present in the city as well as in the countryside, and all over. So we looked at the success of the Green Building Program and saw that uh, um, uh, LEED uh, was having a huge impact on uh, the green building industry. And so we start, we, this started about 2005 and uh, developed these principles, and I was, I was on the executive committee, I was on the soils committee, I was deeply involved with this all the way through. If you know me, you can see that, you can guess who wrote that. Uh, so the idea was, how do we stop depleting ecosystem services, and through design, how do we start building ecosystem services? How do we start uh, creating ecosystem services? And so in 29, we developed uh, this uh, report. We used uh, a star system rather than a uh, gold-silver system that LEED uses. And, and, and then uh, basically this is site planning 101 with a very strong ecosystem services overlay, uh, basically going through the site a system and then using uh, the materials that landscape architects use in their design, water, soil, vegetation, materials. And we, we worked a lot with human health and well-being as part of the system. Unlike LEED, uh, this was very science-based. Uh, about half of the 45 people that worked with us were scientists, were ecologists and soil sciences. So it was a very uh, science-based system. And then we tested um, 150 projects, uh, volunteered to test it. This is the map. We thought all the projects were going to be from uh, Eugene, Oregon, and Seattle. Uh, but we got a pretty good distribution across the United States, a couple in Canada. Uh, you know, Iceland's economy had just tanked, and they hadn't rebooted fishing yet. So someone in Iceland, I'll meet him or her someday, <laughs> Uh, registered for a project there. I have no idea what that project was. And then there was one in, in Spain. Uh, so a couple examples of the projects. Uh, this is the most certified project on the planet. Uh, the landscape was done by Andrew Pogon Associates. It's got living bu building challenge, lead, top, and, and everything. Um, this is a lot of it is a uh, green roof, uh, how do you treat wastewater. Uh, this is what it looks like today. Um, the energy, the, uh, the renewable uh, energy lab near uh, Denver. Uh, this is their work. And then Olin's redoing uh, this canal park in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is uh, Olin's project. Uh, a lot of uh, it had to do with uh, water treatment, uh, their plan, what it looks like today, and people enjoying it. So I mentioned we started in 2005. We wanted to finish it in 
2014, we really finished in 2016. Uh, we developed uh, sites V2 uh, based on those projects and refinement. And um, then now we do use, you notice how lead or sites don't use bronze. Um, projects, I guess, don't like to be bronze, so you're either certified silver or gold or platinum. It's now, we sold it, um, the University of Texas sold it to, and the American Society of Landscape Architects, to uh, GBCI, who now owns it. Uh, so you can find all about this on their website. Um, and we were determined to be some of the first projects certified under V2. And the new medical school that we developed, and I'll get back into this in just a moment, uh, was one, has one of the first projects that was certified under SITES. Uh, I became SITES AP along the way. Uh, I had moved, moving from Texas to Pennsylvania. I was going to write the exam, but I couldn't. I didn't have time. So I was a real guinea pig and took the exam. I passed. I, I'm not sure how. It was the first exam I took in 30 years. It's a hard exam. Is anybody, is anybody here SITES AP? What was your score? Huh? You're probably much better than me, that's why I asked. Anyway, good. Was it, did you think it was a hard exam? No. Oh. You've taken an exam in the past 30 years. So. Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, anyway, I'm, I'm, I passed. Um, so, you develop designs and you select a course of action. This is the, I mentioned with uh, the campus plan, we recognized we had to finish the, the, the landscape master plan, we needed to do the east campus plan, we needed a new plan for the dormitories, um, we needed a new athletics plan, all these have been done now. And, uh, with Imagine Austin, we develop these uh, uh, action items. Uh, by the way, one of the most effective uh, groups um, during the citizen participation process were the skateboarders. When you're involved in citizen participation, groups come in and basically filibuster. You know, so all of this a group's interest will come and there'll be 20 or 30 of them and they'll all get up and speak their three or four minutes uh, so the, the skateboard guy, well, he had dreadlocks and lots of ink, and he stood there and said, okay, I'm here with my, my guys or my boys or whatever he said, and we could stand up, and there were a couple of women. There were about 25, 30 stood up. He said, this is what we want. And he said, they all agree with me. He sat down. He got everything he wanted um, <laughs> because he was succinct. Uh, anyway, um, I love that skateboarder. He was uh, my favorite public hearing person. Um, and then take action. Uh, this is a bit of a live performance. Uh, these are the things that have resulted from the plan. Um, there's a, a street running through um, the part of the University of Texas campus. We basically tore up paradise, or we tore up uh, parking lot and put in paradise. It's an old Joni Mitchell song that went the other way. Um, and uh, I used Locust Walk, that used to be a street in Pennsylvania, as, as a precedent in this. Uh, we hired Pete Walker. Uh, he loved these yellow bricks. Uh, we developed uh, what we wanted in that project. Uh, on the left is Pete's plan, and on the right is what it looks like today. Uh, this is a project uh, I was involved with, with Danelle Biscro, who's a landscape architect, and some ecologists at the Wildflower Center. There are some ugly parking garages that we acquired uh, at University of Texas. So we did a plan to make a green wall uh, along one of the parking garages. Uh, the university loved it, and then they asked, how much will it cost? And we said, oh, about $2.1 million, and they said, will it work? And we said, well, I don't know. <laughs> we really didn't. They said, why don't you do a demonstration project for 
say less than $2.1 million. So we did. We put it on, uh, uh, right before I left, we put it, put it in. It's doing well. So I, I, plans, I'm getting to the end here. Uh, good plans adjust to change. Um, and um, uh, they, in the case of Austin, they grade the, the uh, city every year on these indicators. So, uh, you know, it's Austin. How many live music venues? Did it go up or go, did it go down that, that year? And then at the end of five years, they, they did a very comprehensive assessment. And I would say it's mixed results. A lot of the center's concept was built around a rail system that hasn't happened. And there was also a, a, a very ambitious rewriting of the development code that uh, was also not successful. Um, more success on the campus. This is a, a Nancy Rubin piece, and she calls it monochrome for Austin. Everyone else calls it the canoes. Uh, Anne Hamilton uh, did lovely. Uh, there's a really ambitious public art program at University of Texas, which we wove into the campus plan. Uh, with the new medical school, she did these wonderful images of people uh, that were uh, patients as well as doctors, as well as those of us involved in the design and planning of the, of the Dell Medical School. This is uh, her work in the lobby of the new medical school. Uh, then this, this thing popped up. Oh, I hate sort of pedestrian overpasses. Um, and this one snuck onto the campus plan. And the campus architect told me, Fritz, don't worry about it. They don't have, the communications uh, school doesn't have the money for a, um, uh, for a, a, a pedestrian walkway. And doggone it, they got a $3 million donation. And the, and the architects and the engineers who designed it looked like a gerbil tunnel. <laughs> it was really bad. It was really awful. But the, the, to their credit and the dean's credit, uh, we went out and interviewed two of the most interesting uh, bridge designers, including Rosalius. Uh, and he came up with this design, which I think actually is the best, we'll call it the best design bridge in Austin. Uh, meanwhile, we also worked with Michael Van Valkenburg and the Waller Creek Conservancy. The university is here. Um, is here. Lady Bird Lake is here. I-35 is here. Downtown is here. Part of the idea of this project, a diversion tunnel was built here that captures the water and then throws it out in the lake. So this is no longer the floodplain. Don't think necessarily that's a great idea, but they did it. Uh, so we've tried to make the best of it. And the, part of the idea was to start to bend uh, the east and west parts of Austin through this as well. Uh, these are some of Michael Van Valkenburg Associates drawings. And this is being implemented now. Meanwhile, I mentioned the medical school. The first five uh, buildings, this is the medical school, the hospital, and these two buildings. One of my great accomplishments in life is this building is coming down. It's a big, ugly, multi-bad use facility. It's called the Frank Irwin Center. It's, it's bad for graduation. It, I'm a basketball fan. It's horrible for basketball games. It's bad for Lady Gaga concerts. Uh, it's um, designed for elephants, for the circus, and that's kind of passe. So the athletic department wants to do away with it anyway. So it's going to go, and the medical school will grow here. But Waller Creek, this is the connection to the city, and then it continues up here and through the rest of campus. Uh, this is what that looks like. This is the hospital. Uh, this is the medical school, and uh, that's been redesigned. Meanwhile, we proposed an innovation district between the campus, uh, the campus, the medical district, the state uh, capital, and downtown, and that's moving ahead. Uh, these slides are a little wonky, but the same team, Larry Speck and Sasaki, also did a new plan for the state capital complex that also connect to the university, and that's been approved. OK, some reflections. Um, this is where I live now uh, in 
uh, Philadelphia, looking down at Center City. This is the Locust Walk that I pointed out a moment ago. So from my vantage point, uh, what, what have we learned? Well, one of the things that um, we tried to deal with in the campus plan and weren't successful was there was, uh, and it's a long story, and I can get into it in some detail if you'd like, but there were a number of Confederate statues on the campus. Um, we thought we could work it into the landscape plan, but it just was a little bit outside the scope. So we put some namby-pamby thing like uh, the Confederate statues should be, there should be attention to them. Well, uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, two students ran for student body president, student body vice president on a platform to take the statues down. Um, then uh, the horrible shootings in uh, Charleston, South Carolina occurred. Uh, this happened. Uh, we needed to uh, um, um, clean it up. So we then, I was also on this committee before I left. Um, we had a number of hearings where people could come and speak. And of course, we were accused of being a Taliban that we were going to blow up the, their hair, these people's heritage, and that's, we never were going to blow up anything. And um, so um, two of the statues were taken down immediately. Uh, those of you that are academics who read the Chronicle for Higher Education, there's, in the most recent issue, uh, there is a, a really nice story about how this was put in a museum, and the racism around it is explained. Uh, and it can be studied. Uh, so it's something we didn't address in the plan, but we were, we were able to set the framework for it to be addressed, uh, which it was. Uh, imagine Austin, uh, campus master plans. Those are two that I, I've sort of gone through each of these steps, I think. Um, okay, some other things. I'm about four slides to the end. Uh, I love this quote. Just everybody look at it, you know, just for a second. Plans are worthless, but planning is everything. Uh, over to Eisenhower. Um, these are some things uh, I learned. Uh, do your homework, uh, study the history of a place, its previous plans, existing laws, maps of everything. <coughs> Try to think in geologic time while imagining what may be clearings of hope in the distance. Learn from past uh, failures and successes. Be bold and visionary, but humble. Uh, plans need really good illustrations. Write clearly and avoid jargon. The world does not need another paradigm shift. We've had enough paradigm shifts. It's boss to the paradigm shifts, OK? Um, they're just a two, anyway. Stakeholders, that's another. What exactly is a stakeholder? Is, anyway. Um, Listen, but be prepared to separate the wheat from the chaff. Uh, know your role, play your role. Uh, roll with the punches. Uh, keep a journal or a sketchbook or both. Uh, there's going to be weird things written about you in the press. Uh, don't take it personally. Uh, write press releases. They won't print them, but maybe they will <coughs> print parts of them. Um, when Michael Dell gives you uh, $50 million, to build a new medical school, celebrate that success and build that medical school. Um, or failures aren't helpful. Uh, in any case, keep planning. Uh, this is the most recent book of mine. Um, and this is a personal invitation. Uh, the 50th anniversary of Design with Nature is 2019. We're going to have a big party in Philadelphia. Uh, we have three exhibits, a conference, uh, so uh, it's easy to remember, yeah, uh, summer solstice, come to Philadelphia, uh, design with nature now. The focus will be not uh, the past, but what does design with nature mean for us today in the Anthropocene? Thank you.